I think it's important as we get into Romans chapter 8 to have a really good uh, understanding what has been already established. And I think this will really help you. Now, I don't know if you also have your outline um, for Romans. But Romans chapter 8, we won't be using the outline. We'll be using what I handed out to you. There's just a, some few key thoughts um, that I've written down kind of front and back. Of course, this isn't exhaustive, but it'll give you a general idea. Uh, but if you turn to Romans chapter 1 with me, we'll do a review of Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 7. And for the 11 o'clock message, I'm going to be bringing a message from Romans chapter 8. And then the next week, Lord willing, we'll pick back up in Romans chapter 8 and do more of a verse by verse. The, the message this morning is going to be focused on the reign of life which we have in the spirit and we're going to go through all of Romans chapter 8 uh, and look so in a broader sense but next time when we pick up Sunday school again then we're going to be more specific in a verse by verse break down words do word studies like we've been been doing. But up until this point, I think it's real beneficial. I actually, looking back, I, I kind of should have done a review for chapters 1 through 3 and then chapters 4 through 7, but now we're just going to try and get them all uh, fixed in here all at the same time. I actually, I, I probably need to reset the, the clocks um, so that way uh, we're not too late. But Romans chapter 1, the first thing we see is Paul's new identity. It's his identity. He's no more Saul of Tarsus, but he's Paul. He's a servant. And that word servant is the doulos. It means a bond slave. We are happy slaves. So who's he a servant to? He's a servant of Jesus Christ. But he says at the end of verse 1, it really propels the rest of Romans. He said he's separated unto the gospel of God. And that's what we're getting ready to read about. That's what God has established. That's what he's created. That's what he provides and he presents. But let's look at God's gospel. The gospel of God is the saving righteousness provided in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's outside of works. This is the good news of God. It's provided by God. And it's established by God. But what is it? It's also the power of God. In verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Isn't that wonderful? The, what we come to understand and comprehend about the gospel of God, it's by God and it's by God's power. In verse 16. So it's not a system of works, it's not an obstacle course that we must overcome, but it is by God's power unto salvation. It is given for us to believe. It is for anyone to believe, and that's what he says in verse 16. I'm not ashamed, it is the power of God to everyone that believeth. This gospel is given to us to believe, and to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So it's anyone can believe, any nation. God is no respecter of persons. And it is the means by which God charges righteousness. In verse 17, for therein the gospel of God is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So not only is it by God's power, it's in the work of God, it's through faith, and it's to anybody, but it is also the means by which God imputes righteousness, which he charges us righteous. And that is amazing. In this short little uh, time in chapter 1, he's establishing what the rest of the book is going to be. But also we see this amazing work of God, and, but we also see the ultimate failure of man, don't we? But God is not going to overlook the failure of men. God's not going to overlook sin. Um, for in verse 18, they're, they're coming, Sister Green. In verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven 
against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. So in verse 18, we see God's wrath established. Men suppress the truth of God in God's general revelation. The existence of God is in everyone's conscience. Look at verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest, it's revealed in them. Now this part is not to them. Creation is revealed to us, but God's law is revealed in us, our conscience. So that's a general revelation that we have. For God hath showed it unto them. So men will suppress the knowledge of God even though God has revealed it in them, but he'll also suppress the knowledge of God where God has revealed it to us. In verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now we know that this kind of goes along with the Hebrews chapter 11, where it talks about the invisible, you know how things that are made are made by things which do not appear? You remember uh, how it says that? And a lot of people will say, well, that means the atoms. You know, you, you, you see this pulpit, but you don't see what makes this pulpit. It's these subatomic particles and atoms and everything like that. I mean, it could be, but I believe that it tells us specifically right here what they're talking about. What is invisible but is clearly seen to exist is God's eternal power and Godhead. That's what he says here. The glory of God right here in verse 20, the, from the invisible things of him, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. What's the invisible things? His power, his glory, his being, being understood, so we understand them, we understand he exists, we understand there must be a power greater than what we see, there must be someone greater than the universe who created the universe, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So they can't quite put their finger on it, but we know that, the, that God's glory, his his eternal power, his Godhead, we do not see it, but we see evidence of it. Yeah. So, what happens? Well, man will suppress the truth of God. So much so, and men will worship themselves, and then they'll want to translate God into objects they do not have to answer to. In verses 20 through 25, they'll change the knowledge of God, they'll change the truth of God, into corruptible things. Man's heart will become darkened, will become unthankful. We, again, try to think about why men reject God but make an idol, make dumb idols, make objects to worship. Well, because they know there's a God. We've all been designed to worship something. Most people worship themselves. They're the God of their life. They're the God of all of it, and, but they know that when they worship things, they worship things that they don't have to give account to. And so they do not want, to, they suppress the knowledge of God, and they change it into things that are less intimidating, to objects of verse 23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. So what did God do? He gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now, for the rest of chapter 1, we see sin become worse and worse and worse and worse. If God does not intervene, sin will get worse and worse and worse. It does not get better. All right, chapter 2. We good on time? <laughs> chapter 2. Maybe we'll start a little bit... Uh, uh, picking up the pace. Now chapter 2 talks about sin not only being present, you know, with the lawless and those who are doing despicable things. Well, uh, sin is present not just in obvious gross corruption, but also in self-righteous religious people. Now look, you know, just because it's gross what they're doing, 
It's open. It's, they have no shame. They have glory in their shame. They're bragging in their shame. And the things that they're doing, they know they're worthy of death to, to do. We didn't read that in chapter 1, but it's there. But also, Paul redirects it now to the religious people, who are the ones who are doing the finger pointing. You know, it's kind of like the Pharisee and the publican. And the Pharisee is like, you know, I, I thank God that I'm, I've, I've, uh, I'm not a liar. I'm not a swindler. I've not done these. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, I've not done all these things, but, you know, I thank you for, that I'm not like this publican, you know, who's here. And so in just disgust, they look at the gross, open rebellion and sin. But Paul says, wait just a minute. Who are you? Who shall escape the wrath of God? By judging others, and you're doing the exact same thing. You're seeing all of the grotesque sin in others, but you're, you never see it in yourself. Uh, in verse, so, so he says in uh, verse 1, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. Uh, you can't plead ignorance. You really can't. If you're, if you're so quick to judge others' sin, you know it's a sin. No one will be able to plead ignorance before God. But the very fact that you're calling it out, you know it's, right, you know it's wrong. Uh, you're condemning yourself because you're doing the very wrong that, you're, that you've been aware of. Uh, but he says in verse 2, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that commit such things. So he says in 1 through 3, before you judge the ugliness of sin and others as unredeemable scum, are we also guilty in our own sin? No person will escape the wrath of God, estimating yourself better in relevance to others. And that's what formal religion does. Uh, those who have a self-righteous religion, those who have works-based religion, they'll always compare themselves with others. And but no one will escape the wrath of God. And so in verse 29 in chapter 2, so not only chapter 2, he is, he's bringing out to the Jew, to not just the Jew, but any religious person who's looking upon others as low-life sinners, um, are you guilty of doing the same thing? Are you being a hypocrite? A hypocrite is someone who says they're one thing but behaves a different way. Um, and I'll bring this up a little bit later too, but a hypocrite is someone who may not even know they're a hypocrite. They're deceived. They've deceived themselves into thinking that they're at an elevated position in God's favor doing the same things as others, but they're, they're not. Uh, especially if you have the heart and the attitude of condemning the sin in others and not condemning it in yourself, that's a hypocrite. And so... He says that you rest, in verse 17, because thou art called a Jew and restest in the law and makest thy boast of God. So they're kicking their feet back and resting in this law and this deception which they had of being uh, exempt from the wrath of God, even though they sinned. But who are the true people of God? In verse 29, he says, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So we see that in verse chapter 1, the Gentiles of sin, I mean, all men of sin, this is what happened. This is what originally happened, why men will bring glory or want glory in themselves in their own life in chapter 2. He turns it on to the Jews or anyone who is in a system of religion who are attempting to judge others but never uh, convicted themselves of sin. In chapter 3, he goes on to say, you know, very, at the very beginning, all have sinned, but at the same time, he brings up this point, well, you know what, you really make no difference between me, the religious person, and the person who is shaking their fist at God, the, the atheists, those who, you know, Marilyn Manson, you're making no difference between me who's trying to do good 
and a Marilyn Manson who's writing and singing all this demonic music. Now, that is their argument. So, Paul, if you're not putting a difference between us, what advantage do I have? And that's what he says here in verse 1. What advantage then hath the Jew? What advantage then does have the person who was brought up under a Christian home and things of that nature? And he says much, chiefly, I mean much in every way. There's many places where he asks this rhetorical question and he answers it. If that we were given, verse 2, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. That these scriptures, you know, as, as he told uh, Lois and Eunice and Timothy, he said, Timothy, you've come from this, this beautiful godly home and, you, and since the youth up, you've known the scriptures that are able to make thee wise unto salvation. They were given the scriptures in the home. You know, there's things that I remember uh, honestly, up here, when I'm, I didn't plan on saying, but it'll be something I remember learning as a child that I'll just, it'll just come right out, you know? And it's amazing the, the prophet that is in learning the scriptures as a child up. You know, a Jew, they were raised, uh, I mean, we know that they're raised in a strict sense of Judaism, but what were they given? They were given the prophets, they, were, they knew about the Messiah. They, I mean, and think about all of like the Philistines or the other Gentile nations who are or Babylonian sun god worshipers and things of that nature who are way off. You know, the, the problem, though, was is the Jews trusted in that heritage. They trusted in the oracles. They trusted in the physical for deliverance, for the escape of wrath. They thought that God was just going to pour out wrath on everybody but them. Um, and, but Romans chapter 3, Paul's like, yes, you do have an advantage. You do have an advantage being a Jew. Now, you can't trust in those advantages because salvation is only by grace through faith and the shed blood of Jesus Christ and him alone. Him alone. So, um, chapter 3 is sab. I wanted to make sure that we didn't miss that part. What advantage that, did the Jews have? Many advantages. And then it goes on to talk about the universality of sin and the need for forgiveness. All men, all women need God's forgiveness. The law is not going to provide the escape. The law is not going to provide the safety. Doing good enough is not going to be good enough. So in chapter 3, he talks about the universality of sin. And then he talks about the description in verses 10 through 18 of every person by nature. Every person. And he says in verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, which is a grave. With their tongues they have used the seat, the poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So this is the description of every person who is by nature. And we know that that is the condition of depravity right there. It's just talking about all have sinned. Well, in chapter 3, if we are all guilty and we cannot be justified by the law... I'm on number three, letter C here. We're all guilty and cannot be justified by the law, effort, or ignorance. And that's what he says in 19 and 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, which justified is forgiven uh, legally. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Then the question is, is how can we be justified? And he tells us in verse 21, but now the righteousness of God. Here's God's gospel again. It goes back to chapter 1. What's God's gospel? Now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. If you read the Old Testament hard enough, you're going to see this. But the Lord reveals it to you. You're going to see how the righteousness of God is not by the law, 
but it is by Messiah. And that's what the law and the prophets witness to. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, where there is no difference. Righteousness of God is provided by God, verse 21, to anyone who believes. In verse 22, how can God provide righteousness? In verses 24 through 26, he provides it by grace. In verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I'm on D, 2, 1. By grace, through the redemption, Jesus has procured. God made Christ the altar in his blood to cover sin. God is just to forgive sin of those under the blood and punish for sin to those who are not. God's gospel results in a scenario of a saved person, of, I'm sorry, results in no scenario of a saved person to take credit or boast from any intrinsic values. And that's the rest of chapter 7, well, of chapter 3. Well, where's boasting then? Boasting has to be excluded because God's gospel is a gift from God, and it's by his power. It's not earned. It's not deserved. It's given freely by his grace. That means without works, without attachments. He just said, here, I'm giving you a gift. And we receive that gift by faith. Um, there's no bragging. There, there's no, you, you, you can't brag that you've led a, a higher moral life and therefore deserve to be saved and therefore deserve uh, God's to be pleased with you. So salvation is by grace through faith in him alone. It's a gift of God, thus any man should boast. All right, so moving right along, chapter 4. Now, Paul has established that we are justified by faith. Verse 24 in chapter 3 is one of the big ones because he'll go on and use this as another launch pad into chapter 4 and chapter 5 because being justified freely without a cause, remember that word freely means without a cause, by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In chapter 4, he goes on to give us an illustration of how Abraham was saved by grace through faith. So Abraham's faith was apart from works in verses 1 through 8. And verse 2 of chapter 4, he says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So he says, now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. It really comes down to that, doesn't it? I mean, we know that the, God must give us the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to open our eyes, to open our ears, and then regenerate us, to make us willing in the day of his power to repent of our sins and believe in him. But when you start looking at why people don't, especially from the religious crowd, there's this swell of pride in their life. They just will not surrender pride. They won't surrender their years of service of what they've done. They're, you know, they're, honestly, they're sitting and they have treasured up for themselves all these works that they've done throughout all the years. And they have this body of, of work that they've done that they want to present before God. Now think about Cain and Abel, same way. Cain was a tiller of the ground, and he wanted to say, you know what, I'm, I'm really good at doing this, and I know God commanded me to do it his way, but I'm going to do it my way. And not only uh, will I make God happy, but I'm going to be proud of the work I do. So that, a lot of the times, is a religious but lost kind of person. Um, they want to present their works, be proud in it, and honestly, if I'm proud of it, God should be too. And so that is where we see this breakdown with the Jews, with formal religion, and everything. Paul says that you have not submitted yourselves to the righteousness of God. You've not fully submitted 
denounced any work or anything that your hands have touched as filthy rags before God. That God's only going to receive the best. And the best is his son. That's it. And so, uh, now, when we're saved and we have the fruits of the Spirit, we, do, we are saved unto good works, right? Uh, we do it with a good heart, the right heart to bring glory to God. And only a saved person can do good works. So, but until then, um, our works are not good enough. That's what he says here. In verse 3, For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, that's what that means, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Now that doesn't mean you just don't work anymore. It means for salvation, you don't consider your own works. You can only consider his. So that's what he means in chapter 4. Abraham is the same way. Here's the faith of Abraham. Abraham's faith was apart from circumcision in, in 9 through 12. I'm on the second page. His faith was apart from the law in verse 13 through 15. His faith was in God only, 16 through 25. One of my favorite verses in chapter 4 is verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God, through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Abraham did not consider what his eyes saw as an obstacle to God keeping his promises. His ultimate confidence was in God more than what he saw with his own eyes. So he staggered not in disbelief. There wasn't anything in his life that caused him to stagger at his hope in God. And I, I love that. That's the kind of faith that we also must have in order to be justified. And that's what Paul's saying. How are, how are we justified? Uh, well, it's, you know, we must have like faith. To be counted righteous with God's righteousness, this is imputed righteousness, in verse 23, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Is your faith similar to Abraham's? That's what it's saying. It wasn't written just so we can, oh, look, Abraham had this kind of faith. Huh? That's great for Abraham. But what does that mean for me? Uh, this is the kind of faith that we must have. We must have like faith of Abraham. Stagger not of the things, but wholly trusted upon God. And what did God do? He counted it to him for righteousness. So chapter 4 brings up that illustration. Chapter 5, um, I might have to get this clock reset down here. That's, I, I don't, that one's off and this one's off. So I guess I can use the shadow <laughs> outside to see how, how far we are. Um, but chapter 5 now talks about the benefits, the glorious benefits of being justified by faith. Chapter 5 is one of my favorites uh, as we talk about uh, the benefits of imputed righteousness. It doesn't take us long to find out the first one. In chapter 5, verse 1, we have peace with God, and we have the peace of God. So we have a judicial peace with God being justified by faith. This is the only way to have peace with God. You hear it all the time. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know if it's any of those uh, Clint Eastwood movies. It sounds like a line that may be in there, kind of like, you better make your peace with God. You know, the only way to make peace with God is through Christ. That's it. There is no peace with God outside of Jesus Christ. None. And so being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And he goes on to talk about the other benefits. We have peace with and of God, and we rejoice in hard times knowing that it's strengthening our faith in verses 2 through 5. That's also a beautiful benefit. But he goes on in chapter 5, verses 12 through 21, to talk about our position in God's imputed righteousness. What does it mean to be in Christ? We have an absolute assurance of being in Christ. Um, it's also a beautiful benefit of being justified by faith, the Holy Spirit giving us witness of this. 
and in verse 6, really, it talks about the accomplishment of Christ in verses 6 through 9 and how God commendeth his love in verse 8. His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were weak and could not come to God, God came to us, God sent his son, and God bore our sin. What we could not do, he did for us by his power because we are powerless to go to him. And if God so loved us, he's also going to keep us in his hands, isn't he? There's nothing that's going to uh, reach us that doesn't pass through. We just have amazing assurance of life. And verse 9, much more we know we'll be saved from the wrath of God being in Christ. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we know that it took the gracious benevolence of God to initiate salvation because I could not come to him nor did I want to come to him. But by his grace, he has rescued me from the bondage of sin and it's the bondage of sin that gives us that attitude towards God, that we hate God. We don't want to come to God. We don't want the things of God. We don't want the light to shine in our darkness. We, want, we, we prefer to change the glory of God into corruptible things and then uh, just only you know, make these gods that are no gods that you don't have to have accountability to. And that's what natural man does. But, you know, I love it. God knowing this elected me before the foundation of the world. And that to, to one day that he should penetrate my heart, open my eyes and my ears so that I could see that the dangerous state I was in. And, there, and he saved me. He gave me the desire to come to him. Chapter 5 talks about that. Our position in God's imputed righteousness in Christ. Adam's actions caused bondage and sin. I may just read the rest of this. Adam's actions caused bondage and sin to exist upon all. The reign of death. The law shouts at people they are guilty and transgressions are given more knowledge. And in, you can read that in 12 through 21. But in the opposite way, what did Christ's actions do? Cause freedom to exist upon all who believe. There's a reign of life. Grace is greater than what the law exposes. So you're going to hear me talk about this later because he really, because when we start in chapter 8, he picks this subject back up again. The reign of sin and death versus the reign of the spirit and life. Okay, the, the, the two differences there. In chapter 6, he deals with the law, and he deals with the sanctified life. Now, if you think about this, um, now we talked about sanctification as positionally and practically, and he kind of you know, roughly divides, the, it's not perfect, but he roughly divides chapter 6 into half, talking about the first half, talking about our position as we're sanctified in Christ, that God has redeemed us. He's brought us from out from where we were to himself in a judicial legal way. Positionally, we have been separated. That's what sanctification is. We've been separated from where we are and brought to himself for a purpose. Practically or experientially, we are living every day in this Christian life in the process of sanctification, that we are being conformed to the image of his son, that we are one who are, was saved unto do good works. We'll never accomplish that in this flesh and because we have this old outer man who's still with us, right? Um, inwardly, it has been accomplished. Positionally, it has been accomplished. Experientially, it is being accomplished. So Paul goes on to say, you know, now that we have these benefits in chapter 5, of justification by faith and how we're in Christ and how we're secured in Christ. Well, what about the law? You know, what about serving the law? And he says, well, well actually what you're saying is, is now should we continue in sin? And that's the very first question he gives in chapter 6. God forbid. 
I'm actually, yeah. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So what this means is not only do you not want to continue in sin, but you can't because we're in a reign of grace. We've been ransomed. We have a new master. We have a new father. We're in a new family. Uh, legally, we're in a new family. You know, so you can't continue in the old family when, you've been, when there's already been a legal transaction putting you in a new family. Nor do you want to go back to that. So we don't continue in sin. And then uh, I like uh, here in Romans 6, um, look at B, A. <laughs> Legally, the child of God is the same as dead. The law demanded death and hell from the sinner. But Christ suffered that hell, died that death for the believer, so the believer is reckoned dead in Christ. So we cannot continue in a state that we were crucified with Christ in, but we're alive in the God now. So what about continue to sin? So if you put those two together, the first 11 verses, do we continue positionally in sin? It's impossible. Do you, and then the last half of the chapter, do we continue to sin? Now we're talking experientially in our everyday life. No. You should surrender the things which you used to be passionate about and now have passion in your new life to serve him. That we yield our members to servants to righteousness, not servants. Don't you know that you are the servant to whom you serve? The whoever you serve is, it has your ma is your master. Your passions are the things of God and your life should reflect it. And finally, in chapter 7, the old relationship to the law and new relationship to Christ is illustrated as a death and a marriage. Free to leave the behaviors of the old relationship in the past. The law is not evil. It has done its job showing you death in the old relationship. But we all have an inner conflict. Paul discovered a law of life for the Christian. Actually, turn to chapter 7, because we're going to pick this back up in the morning's message. Look at chapter 7, verse 21. I find then a law. This is a principle. This does not mean the law of the ten commandments, a law that you can disobey. This is a law that you cannot break. It's impossible to break. Like the law of gravity. Right? <laughs> the gravity is a law, not a suggestion. So, I find then a principle. A binding stronghold principle that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So he finds that the Holy the Spirit, the new person which God has put in you, has a desire for the things of God, but he finds that his flesh is still with him. In verse 23, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. He's talking about his outward man, the outward man which perish. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God, and that's rhetorical, he knows. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So we are talking about the law of sin and death versus the law of the spirit of life. Law of sin and death is death, but the law of the spirit of life has made us free in Christ Jesus. And that's what we'll pick back up in this morning message. All right, Heavenly Father, thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, for this study. Father, there's, there's so much here. It's just a treasure, Father, and just that we gleaned this morning, and it's how, how full and rich and deep it is. Well, how good you are to us, Father. You give us this beautiful, this beautiful truth. May we not take it for granted. May we um, see it for the treasure that it is. And we, may we hide it in our heart. Lord, we do pray your blessings upon the remainder of the, the day and the worship service. In Jesus' name, amen.